Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii. More specifically, welcome back to Energy in America, uh, which we do on Wednesday afternoons at three o'clock every other week. And we're doing it today with Mac Max Pizier. Um, and he's a researcher with the Energy Policy Research Organization in Washington. He joins us uh, by VMIX call from New York City. Uh, hi, Max, how are you? Good evening, uh, or good afternoon, I think, uh, in Hawaii. Happy New Year to everybody. Happy New Year to you, too. So we've Thank had you. a lot of action lately. Uh, we've had action, of course, in, um, in Iran and Iraq and with uh, President Trump and the assassination a few days ago and all the, the fallout that fell out afterward. And one of the things that fell out, there are many things that fell out, but one of the things that fell out was oil. And people were very concerned, a lot of global anxiety, I think. And the price of oil went up to like $70 uh, and then mm -hmm. it began to come down again. And I'm so curious, uh, you know, how you feel about that, what your research tells you about that process, uh, what we what we have experienced in the past on such dramatic events, uh, what we experienced in this case last few days and what we can uh, expect to experience going forward as a result of this this uh, controversy, this confrontation uh, between Iran and the United States. So, Max, tell us tell us about the history of oil prices, uh, you know, in crisis. Well, um, many of us uh, have this, this memory of uh, oil price crises, uh, especially the one that was induced back in 1974 with the Arab oil embargo. And that has been, that story, that myth has been carried over forward uh, into the present. Some, to some degree, it was reinforced uh, um, during the first Iraq war in, 19, uh, in, in 1990, 1991. Um, but the lessons of the last 10 years, it's sort of like the Energizer bu uh, Bunny story. It just, we, we can't keep, uh, uh, there, there are just too many things that, that just keep coming back from that story. And that's the North American shale uh, revolution. Um, the fact that we've had such robust development in the mid-continent of the United States, um, huge developments in, in uh, crude oil and natural gas resources and production uh, we've managed to mitigate um, major uh, potential price spikes from geopolitical events, such as the ones that have been taking place, especially between the United States and Iran, uh, for the last uh, four or five years. Um, that that's essentially the theme that that that's uh, that's been in play. However, there there are a considerable number of people, commentators, uh, uh, speculative commentary is is the uh, the term that I've read just uh, this evening. Too much speculative commentary saying that uh, drastic things are going to happen. And they forget that story of the last 10 years, the Energizer Bunny story, that we've had this incredible uh, abundance brought on us uh, because of uh, what's going on in the mid-continent of the United States. Well, so, okay, I was, I was gonna ask you a question that has really been on my mind for a long time. And that is how how are these prices set? So you you know uh, the implication, as with the stock market, would be uh, that if you have people are anxious about the future supply of oil, if they perceive, if traders perceive that there will be, and and consumers perceive there will be a shortage because of global events, crises like this, uh, then the price goes up, um, and that's what happened in the past few days. But if they perceive that maybe it's not a crisis anymore. Uh, then the price is, the price will rebalance and settle down a little bit. But my question for you is, how does that work? Who are the people who are are influencing that price? Who are the traders, if you will, if it is traders and organizations around the world uh, who experience the anxiety and who push the price up or down depending on the news, the news in the U.S., the news overseas, the news from the administration, which we can't rely on very well. Uh, and the news from, you know, the media, which uh, which are going to be uh, more accurate. Um, so how, what's the process as you see it, for pushing it up and bringing it down? Um, the headline uh, numbers that we see, the benchmarks, are generally driven uh, by the futures market. The futures markets uh, are global. Uh, they run pretty much 24 hours uh, a day. Um, they they balance the interests of, of three constituencies, 
uh, producers, the crude oil producers who need to find future markets. So they sell their, their uh, uh, they use the futures market to sell forward into the future. Consumers who need to buy at different periods uh, across uh, th these particular calendars, mostly refineries. And then you have speculators in the middle. Speculators, it, it's a encompassing term, uh, hedge funds, individual traders. And again, they're located globally. Um, some just speculate in the futures markets themselves. Some people, uh, some constituencies take uh, interest in particular cargoes uh, that are being shipped shipped from one point to another and also trade the paper against it. So there's, there's a, that middle ground, the, the so-called speculators take uh, um, a variety of shapes, mm -hmm. mostly paper, mostly uh, cargoes or some combination of paper and cargoes. And what ends up happening is that, that's the headline that number that you see throughout the day, throughout the trading day and gets quoted at the end of the day. Uh, primarily there's uh, two critical benchmarks. There's uh, the one for uh, North America, West Texas Intermediate, and for the U.S. Uh, markets. And there's the one for uh, Atlantic Basin markets, uh, which is known as Brent. And then there's two, two or three other ones, uh, Dubai and, and a few other ones that uh, give you a sense of, uh, of discrepancies between prices globally between uh, these different regions. Mm. So Th th those are the people, those are the, that's the activity that you're seeing. And uh, I think to your point about, well, the geopolitical angle, there are news stories. Some speculators try to push the price one way or the other, play either play the short side or the long side. Um, and the hedgers, such as the, uh, the producers and consumers, producers, uh, oil producers, or the uh, consumers being the refiners, uh, try to lock in uh, something to their advantage uh, in this this whole interplay that takes place. Mm. Well, I mean, you point up uh, one thing that I think people may not fully understand, and that is that people in the market, organizations in the market, are there for a reason, to make money. Uh, and they Absolutely. want to place their bets in such a way so that they win the, win the game. Um, mm -hmm. And so, but, but let me explore one other thing with you, and that is, uh, you know, re recently I saw the Eddie Murphy movie uh, called Trading Places with Eddie Murphy and Ralph Bellamy. And it was the New York commodities market, if you remember, not far from where you're sitting right now, I think. Um, right. And it was it was a it was a chaos uh, when when they started manipulating and the, and the price went up or down. Um, and, you know, it, what struck me was the physicality of it. Uh, of course, we all know that the New York Stock Exchange is like that. And and certainly the commodity market moves faster than that. But um, is, is oil something that's traded in an open physical market like that? Is traders standing around uh, with little buy and sell chits? Or is it uh, more computerized? How does it work these days? I, I think it's a combination of both. You, see, you have the pit at the NYMEX, uh, the New York Mercantile Exchange over uh, uh, just off the Hudson River, uh, the Manhattan side of the Hudson River. and. Uh, you have electronic trading uh, that, that goes on uh, 24 hours a day. Um, and you have futures markets for not just uh, physical commodities like uh, energy commodities like uh, crude oil, but currencies, um, agricultural commodities, and metals, and so on. Yeah. Uh, these markets, uh, the currencies in particular, uh, move 720, uh, 24 7. Uh, I'm not sure of the uh, the parameters on on the uh, the energy commodities, but uh, it's there's uh, the trading that takes place at the NYMEX, the physical trading, where you see traders uh, wave their hands and uh, uh, do any number of other things, uh, grimace at each other all day long. Um, and then there's the electronic trading, like uh, such as uh, what, where people don't see each other, they just see numbers pop up on the screen. Um, you know, you're starting to ask a question. You mentioned, Please. Max, that uh, you know there are there are little markets in various places, particularly in the Middle East, uh, and mm -hmm. I, I suppose in any market the price is set with uh, buyers wanting to buy and sellers wanting to sell. Um, and so, what what is the effect of a given settlement uh, in a in a given market uh, against other markets around the world? If if you say that there's a market in this city. Or this country, um, how does the price established in that market 
affect the market in another city, another country? What's the global network on that? Well, uh, generally people uh, use the benchmarks, uh, the ones that I mentioned, uh, West Texas Intermediate uh, for North America, Brent for Atlantic Basin, um, and they key from that. Uh, you can actually, uh, if, list, if viewers are interested, viewers and listeners are interested, they can go to uh, Chevron's website and they can see the prices as, as they're quoted for particular different particular grades of crude oil. And it will be something uh, to the effect plus or minus a dollar against WTI benchmark on, on a particular day, uh, plus or minus uh, a few pennies uh, on a particular day versus uh, Brent benchmark, something like that. So all these things are listed and which refinery would be buying them. So uh, right away, you, it's, it's, it's a very, that aspect of it is very transparent for uh, a consumer like Chevron that needs crude oil for its refineries on the West Coast. Uh, um, don't know how to finish that particular sentence, but. Uh, well, but now, you know, we know, for example, here in Hawaii, that uh, one electric eyes oil uses still a lot of oil. Uh, we're mm -hmm. working on renewables, but we still use a lot of oil to generate, mm -hmm. um, you know, electricity for, uh, for the economy. Um, and we buy, Hawaiian Electric buys this for months at a time. They, they enter into contracts um, to buy, right. for example, Indonesian uh, uh, light oil um, for, you know, I don't know, four or five, six months where the price is set for that period. That's got to be right. uh, a... Uh, a moderating factor, isn't it? Because we don't have to worry about the price of oil for several months. We already bought it at an established rate. So why why sh should we care about these uh, machinations in the market uh, going up and down? After all, we're we're settled for six months. Um. Yes. No. Uh, yes and no. Uh, you're, you're you're settled up. Uh, a hedger, like a consumer, like a refiner, wants to uh, make sure that they can lock in their price and understand what uh, their cost structure is. Rather than be exposed to the volatility of the market, they'll use the futures to um, hedge uh, their future future purchases, say Indonesian oil, uh, such as you mentioned. Um, and in that way, they can offset, they, they can either take advantage of some of the fluctuations or offset some potential losses. Uh, so when they finally produce products from that crude oil, petroleum products, gasoline, uh, diesel, jet uh, jet fuel, um, their, their revenue streams are, are, are relatively are more predictable than if uh, without the, uh, the hedging instruments. So we, I suppose, the line electric and any other utility, even as it deals on future contracts, um, it's going to be watching. It's going to be watching these events in the Middle East, and uh, of course, uh, you know, oil traders who trade on trade on a commodity basis, they're going to be watching hedge funds and the like, oh. facing bets, if you will. They're going to be watching everything moment to moment, aren't they? Right. Well, uh, the uh, the the market participants that use the futures market for hedging purposes are the producers and the consumers. They're not particularly active. And so what you need to introduce is liquidity. If somebody needs to sell, somebody needs to be on the other side of the trade. And that's where the speculators come in, the, uh, the hedge funds. They provide the liquidity throughout the day. So somebody, so that's what the engineering of the market is. Um, and, and they service the, the, the uh, the uh, the financial inducement is different for um, the speculators. They're looking for some way to uh, play the uh, either a rising market or uh, a market that that's uh, decreasing as far as price. Um, whereas the consumers and the producers are seeking to hedge. And it's it's uh, there are different incentives, and they balance and and, and the uh, the clearing people well within the markets tend to. Um, uh, balance these interests out so you have a constant uh, constant trading Avail trading available and that's that's what creates the uh, liquidity so it, it strikes me that not all traders 
not all not all buyers and sellers uh, are, are equally competent to guess into the future to make their bets. Um, and the exactly. distinguishing feature between a trader who is um, you know making some money or maybe losing, and a trader who is making a lot of money is uh, his or her ability to analyze the news as as it is as it is revealed to him or her uh, into the future and and like uh, crystal ball so if you're more accurate on how things are going to go tomorrow the day after and so forth based on the headlines based on whatever you're reading and thinking and hearing then you could be more successful in other words if you're accurate in in perceiving the future if you're accurate in your speculation you're going to make more money am i right about this I think so. I, I think uh, one thing we haven't uh, touched on here yet is uh, um, who's the helmsman. So we have Donald Trump as, as president. Um, there's a lot of unpredictability there. there, there it's, 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 things change just even throughout the day. Whereas uh, the prior president uh, uh, appropriately had the nickname No Drama Obama. So... Um, <laughs> The, the, the contrast. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes. So, so, so the contrast is, just, even colloquially, that that contrast I, I think is strong. So, um, there's no telling how the current administration is is going to pursue foreign policy. Uh, is it going to be on whim? Um, you know, we, we have the whole impeachment process. So, I think certain speculate speculative interests uh, try to. Anticipate maybe a sharper move than than expected, but it's not unwarranted given um, um, the last three years' history. Uh, the, the amount of unpredictability we've had across maybe say twenty minutes even throughout a day. Yeah, yeah, and he who can figure out you know what uh, Mr. Trump is going to do tomorrow morning, he he'll do better. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, there are very few people who can predict what Mr. Trump is going to do tomorrow morning. Uh, well, let's exactly. take a minute. Or even let's in... take... I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Uh -huh. Let's take a minute break, if you will, Max, and we'll come back and then we'll mm -hmm. talk about your slides and uh, some of the drill down uh, that we are we are bound to discuss in this connection. We'll be right back on the other side of this break. Okay, we're back with uh, Max Peasier of EPRING, Energy Policy Research Organization in Washington. And he joins us uh, by a VMIX call from New York City. We're talking about uh, the effect of um, the, the, uh, the confrontation with Iran on oil prices. We've seen them go up and down uh, dramatically within a day or two. And now we're trying to figure out why. We're trying to figure out what will happen in the future. Max, you had some examples you wanted to point out of some of the principles we've been covering. Uh, there was a graph, I think. Uh, that yeah, I let's, let's look at the slides. This one's called, despite so, the geopolitical excitement, uh, product prices are range-bound. Interesting. Right. So uh, we had some activity during the beginning. These are uh, the key product prices uh, over the course of 2019. Near the beginning of the year, um, we had inventories that were tightening. And so the blue line, which is gasoline, you see it rise. But from about July through the end of the year, we've been in the, this tight range. And that's what the, the, uh, the two black bars, uh, horizontal bars, indicate. Uh, we've had any number of uh, events that have taken place in these last six or seven months. But I, I thought it would be good, given our discussion, uh, the prior discussion we had in the last 15 minutes, just to isolate two events, especially as they relate to Iran, and uh, uh, just to show what their, what effect they had on prices. So the, the first critical event was the uh, uh, what took place on September 14th in Saudi Arabia, the drone attack on the oil production facilities, which uh, eliminated half or five million barrels per day of, of Saudi production. Mm -hmm. That's the top red arrow, and you can see how... Uh, a sharp spike, but we're the the world. We not just we, but the world was in such a, uh, a, a fortuitous situation, fortunate and fortuitous situation. We had abundant supplies, lots of sources, so you can see how that spike drained away very quickly. Um, 
and uh, Sony production was restored. Uh, then the second uh, event is more more a set, uh, what's been taking place from the middle of December through uh, most recently. And again, you see a small rise uh, to a peak uh, on Friday, January 3rd. That, that's what that little peak is there. Um, and then a dissipation. So it goes back to where uh, uh, the, the theme that sort of I, uh, I set at the beginning of uh, our discussion was um, the like the Energizer Bunny that, that just keeps on giving, uh, the North American shale story uh, just keeps on giving. It, uh, the last 10 years have provided these these substantial buffers to, uh, to the geopolitical tensions. And that um, favors uh, consumers like you and myself, people who have to uh, rely on uh, commuting by a vehicle or uh, yeah, so effectively, it it's, it it neutralizes. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, but you know, Max, I mean, you know, we we were living there in a in a period of a day anyway, maybe more, um, where we thought we were going to be in a war, that we were in fact in a war, and that the mm -hmm. whole Middle East would melt down into a uh, you know a, a highly dangerous, um, highly volatile uh, display of weapons and and attacks between the United States and Iran. That's what it certainly looked like, and and it, was, it had all, all the prospects of going global, for that matter. This has got to be a, a real shake-up to the, those who would uh, make bed, bets and hedge bets on, on oil prices into the future. So my question to you is, those those uh, limitations that we saw on your slide, uh, where mm -hmm. it's not going to exceed this price, and not going to be below that price, you know, moderating even even crisis events, would those limitations apply if your worst fears were realized? If, in fact, this is 1914 all over again, uh, or 1939 uh, that, all over again? That's a big fear. The guns of August, yes. Uh, yeah. I, I, um, I, I use the term speculative commentary. One of the speculative commentaries that I read, where you would really have something serious happen, uh, in this part of the world is if the Straits of Hormuz were blocked. Uh, thankfully, because of, of uh, I think, one or two uh, U.S. aircraft carrier groups um, and other constituencies in, in, the, uh, in the Gulf, that doesn't look as though it's going to happen. But if that sort of event took place, then you would have between, you know, one-fifth of the world's oil supply would be blocked. Um, that sort of event does not seem imminent. Uh, maybe Friday evening, January third. Maybe uh, through the weekend that that people were considering that, but um, that threat has dissipated. My sense is, is that you know, if we're speculating, it's if that sort of threat was imminent, that's when um, uh, those those two black bars that you saw on on the graph uh, would be. Uh, Oh, what's the word? The uh, we we'd fly through the uh, the upper bar. Um, yeah. that, that, that's where uh, prices would go through the roof. Um, yeah. But uh, but we're we're not there. Um, you know, interestingly, you know, when, when we reference uh, Iran, we forget how much oil it produced, uh, say, during the time of the Shah. So it was between five and a half and six million barrels. Right now, it's uh, producing between one and a half and three million barrels, half the amount. Uh, and that's for a variety of reasons. So even just removing Iran's production off, off world markets is not that, not as big of a, a, a deal as say it was uh, back in 1979 when the Shah abdicated, uh, the U.S. embassy was taken, uh, the, uh, the, the embassy employees were taken hostages, and we had the standoff for that uh, extended period. Yeah. But it, it, I guess it, uh, it shows you that... Um... The Straits of Hormuz not only carry Iranian oil, they carry oil from other countries in the Gulf. And so if the Straits of Hormuz uh, were somehow blocked, either by what somebody threatened, uh, the Iranians threatened sinking a ship there, it's 21 miles wide, I'm not sure how many ships you'd need. Um, but but if, it was, if it was blocked uh, by military force or otherwise, uh, then it would it would be more than that uh, one and a half million barrels of, of oil right. from Iran. It would be a lot more, and it would have a big bigger effect than just Iran. Yeah. 
Right. And, and, you know, there's a lot of vested interest there because uh, 90 percent of the Saudi uh, Saudi Arabia's uh, national budget uh, is determined by oil revenues. You stop that. Granted, they have terminals on, on, on the uh, the Red Sea side. But uh, again, uh, their their main production uh, fields are on the eastern side of the other uh, country. Mm -hmm. If you inhibit that, then um, uh, the government uh, revenues uh, cease to flow in. So yeah. Um, yeah. it's uh, you know, so so there's a it's not just it's not the rest of the world. It's not Japan. It's not China. And it's not just uh, the uh, the U.S. Maybe receives uh, uh, North America receives very little Saudi imports these days. But um, well, one, of the, one of the things that you guys please. follow is uh, LNG, <laughs> natural gas around the world from the U.S. and other sources. And I wonder, uh, I, I'm, I'm taking a guess here. I'm, I'm guessing that none of this affair with uh, Iran affects uh, the price or availability of natural gas. And the natural gas market would continue uh, unabated. Am I right? Well, yes and no. I mean, the, the largest LNG producer is uh, Qatar, uh, located in the Persian Gulf. So their production, their exports, and, they, and they're solely rely, uh, reliant on, mostly reliant on exports, um, that if anything happened in the Straits of Hormuz, their uh, uh, cargoes would not be able to get through. So there would be an effect. Um, it would be an effect. Um, yeah. But you've had uh, uh, this uh, development, especially in Australia, especially in the United States, uh, again, in the last 10 years, the Energizer Bunny that keeps on giving. Um, and there would be coverage from the, uh, those particular constituencies if Qatar's uh, 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 LNG exports were for somehow were, were not able to be uh, moved through the uh, Straits of Hormuz. Okay. Um, we're out of time, Max. We'll have to leave it there. Okay. I wish there were more sorry, time okay. to discuss this, but I but I feel Likewise. that we'll be talking about it again. <laughs> great, great. Thank you, Max Peter. E Prink. Great to talk to you. Happy New Year. And we'll see Aloha. you again, hopefully in better times. Absolutely, yes. Aloha. Thank you.